Ah, OK, welcome to the wonderful world of earthworms. Now, earthworms are, uh, so the organisms that we talked about in the surface area to volume ratio video are all things that have these massive surface areas and short diffusion paths, and therefore they need to live in um, water or certainly somewhere very, very damp. In that, they have this massive surface area over which to lose water. And if you lose too much water, uh, all these cells dry out and uh, then you die. So um, it's really important for those organisms with this massive surface area that are doing all of their exchange across their surface. Certainly they're getting oxygen in, they're getting rid of the carbon dioxide, but they would also lose too much water if they didn't live in an aquatic environment. So this is our first, um, I suppose, terrestrial uh, organism and we can see here its proper name, its binomial name is Lumbricus terrestris. Terrestris means earth um, and that's because we find them in soil now and they're not strictly um, massively terrestrial and a worm can't be on a pavement, a dry pavement for too long before it dries out into a bit of, yeah, it just dries out, kind of mummifies. Um, because their cylindrical shape and therefore, as you can see when we've pinned one out, massive, massive surface area in relation to this sort of volume in the, in the middle. This is its volume. This huge thing here is its surface area. So it does live, need to live uh, in a damp environment. So I won't call it fully terrestrial, uh, more like sort of semi-terrestrial. So it needs to live in a damp environment uh, to conserve water. So, as far as its adaptations go, what are we looking at here? We're looking at a large surface area. To volume ratio. I'm not writing ratio and it is very often written down. I don't think you need to. You've got the little two dots in there to mean I'm looking at a ratio. So large surface area to volume ratio. So it can do its gas exchange over the surface. which is helpfully called the epidermis. So earthworms are intrinsically interesting. They are uh, segmented worms. So we'll just... Uh, this is just for your general curiosity. Um, they have uh, they uh, what we call a holozoic organism. They're detritus feeders, so they live on dead leaves and uh, bits of soil and soil bacteria. They've got a mouth in which they ingest their food. They take it through into their pharynx, which has one set of enzymes in it. It goes down, 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 past all these other structures that we're not going to worry about, into the crop and the gizzard, and then into the intestine, which sort of pretty much takes the rest of the gut up um, and the rest of the worm up until we get to the anus. Uh, they do excrete nitrogenous waste and they've got these, these little wiggly bits here and where they excrete their nitrogenous waste from. Uh, they've got quite a big surface area and live somewhere damp. I'm thinking they probably do um, ammonia, perhaps, as the nitrogenous waste. Not too sure. You can look it up. That's what Google's for. They do have a very primitive nervous system, so they've got a, a nervous system there. And... These, all the rest of it, all these interesting looking bits around the side, and you'll see them, they show up very well in the dissection, um, are all their reproductive structures. Nothing to do with gas exchange. Oh, and this is how they have sex. They're kind of, they're hermaphrodites, so you can see that we've got uh, spermatheci for storing sperm, we've got uh, seminal vesicles here, and they're kind of 
wrap round each other, that's what this sort of segment is clitellum's for, and exchange sperm, which is interesting. Anyway, just to turn over, this is a kind of a cross section through the middle of the worm, so they've sort of it's as though they've chopped it that way and you're looking at the side. And this is showing the anterior part of the body with the gut. But what we're interested in is adaptations for gas exchange. So it's taking in its gases over its body surface, but we can see here we have a circulatory system. And we've got a dorsal going along the top blood vessel and we've got a ventral going along the bottom of the worm blood vessel and in between we've got these sort of hoops of vessels pair in each segment so two in each segment each receiving blood from the body wall and here we've got what these are called false hearts they're just little expanded bits with a muscle and that's just going to squeeze on the blood and kind of push it around a bit in a fairly sort of desultory and slow fashion. And what you will notice when you do the dissection is that what's inside of these vessels is red. So, we're certainly taking in our gases over the surface, but they're going directly, so we have close to the surface, a capillary or blood supply close to the surface. So these hoops are bringing the blood really, really close to the surface. And it's then circulating oxygen to the cells and circulating carbon dioxide to the surface. So that makes it sort of slightly more efficient than I say a flatworm, those planarians with their lovely immortality, um, which is just effectively just diffusing in and out across that really, really short diffusion path and big surface. The other thing that earthworms have is that their blood is red, and that's a dead giveaway that it's got haemoglobin. So haemoglobin in the blood. Why is that important? We say that haemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen. Well, what does that mean? That means it will take it out of the air effectively and carry it to the cells. So this is going to carry oxygen to the cells. Um, the rest of the picture, and I'm sure that you'll do this when you do the dissection, you know, it's kind of all about the reproductive system, which does stick out like a sore thumb inside of an earthworm, far more interesting than you could imagine.